Hello and happy Thursday, everyone. Uh, for me, it would be good morning. For my European guests here today, it is good afternoon and welcome to another episode of PatristaCast. Today, I am very delighted to have uh, three returning guests and one brand new guest who's getting his initiation ritual into PatristaCast today. So I'll start with him. Uh, Dr. Alphonse Fierst is a professor at Westphalische Wilhelms Universität in Münster, where he is also the program manager for the Origin Research Center. Dr. Fierst, thank you for joining PatristaCast and welcome. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and returning is Dr. Christoph Markschies at Humboldt University, Berlin. Uh, George Karamanilis, University of Vienna, although he is currently in Athens, and Johannes Zakuber, Oxford, currently in Berlin. Is that correct? It is correct. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Hi. So today, today uh, it's good that we've got um, three Germans and somebody who teaches in Austria because we're going to talk about the legacy of one of the most fascinating and influential figures in the history of Christian theology. That's Adolf von Harnack, a uh, Protestant theologian, late 19th and early 20th century, famous perhaps in the patristic world, more so for his Hellenization of Christianity thesis that has uh, trickled down to this day. We see it in almost every work on patristics and philosophy, including in uh, all of the works from the my guests here today. So we're going to talk about Adolf von Harnack. And to do so, I thought I would uh, contrast a couple of quotes from the patristic period, and then uh, a, a couple of quotes from Harnack. And then we can uh, kind of get our hands dirty. What do you say? <laughs> I tried my best. I could. My office here is a mess, and I couldn't find my copy of Tertullian's um, prescription against the heresies. So I can't read the full quote. But in that uh, text, he uttered the famous rhetorical question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What has... Is Christianity a rational faith or does it not need the use of reason at all? And then as if an answer a few, maybe four decades later, Origen, <clears throat> in his letter to his student, uh, Gregory Thaumaturgus, as if he's talking to Tertullian. But I would wish you Quote, but I would wish you to employ the full power of your pursuit ultimately for Christianity. Therefore, as a means, I would beseech you to extract from the philosophy of those of the Greeks all those general lessons and instructions which can serve Christianity. And whatever from geometry and astronomy will be useful for interpreting the Holy Scriptures. Thus, what the children of the philosophers say about geometry and music, grammar, rhetoric, and astronomy as handmaids to philosophy, we also may say concerning philosophy itself in relation to Christianity, end quote. So at the turn of the third century and through what the first half of the third century, we see in these two writers here a tension between the gospel and Greek philosophy. How are we to receive these? Now let's bring in our our friend Adolf von Harnack from his uh, History of Dogma. <clears throat> Quote, the characteristic of this dogma is that it represents itself in no sense as foolish, but as wisdom and at the same time, desires to be regarded as the contents of revelation itself. Dogma, in its conception and development, is a work of the Greek spirit, 
on the soil of the gospel. Those Greeks, man, they're, they're dangerous, end quote. Second quote from, from uh, Harnack here. The attempts at deducing the genesis of the church's doctrinal system from the theology of Paul or from compromises between apostolic doctrinal ideas will always miscarry. For they fail to note that to the most important premises of the Catholic doctrine of faith belongs an element which we cannot recognize as dominant in the New Testament, that is, the Hellenic spirit. So here we have, end quote. So here we have Adolf von Harnack, the great historian of Christianity, creating a distinction between what he might see as an authentic gospel, which he seems to boil down essentially to the ethical principles of the Sermon on the Mount, and then the dogmatic formulations that came later, and he sees in these dogmatic formulations the influence more of Hellenism, Athens, Greek philosophy, than he does in the gospel. I'll start I'll go clockwise here uh, from the uh, boxes on my screen. And uh, it's good that uh, Dr. Fierst, you're the first one because you're uh, a first time guest here. So Harnack's thesis, is there merit to it? Um, now, if I begin, I fear that I will blow up the whole discussion now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> uh, so because uh, out of my view so oh oh let me say first Harnack is not the first one who has this right. idea of what That's we call right. Hellenization it's much longer and so on right. Right. and the second point his idea on Hellenization is much is somewhat more complicated than it is often depicted as a kind of simple um a language or of the gospel and then some metaphysical speculation of yes. Hellenization and so on. But that's not my point here. Uh, my point here is really that I would make a case for the point that Hellenization and dehellenization has been a wrong approach hmm. all along and from, from the outset. And I really would like to make a case to dismiss these categories and these terms. And my main point is that these categories presuppose a duality which is not given in patristics and in late antiquity or early Christianity, uh, a duality between faith and reason, or how you want to say it, between revelation and rationality, or between theology and philosophy and so on, or Athens and Jerusalem, <laughs> like this purely rhetorical statement of yeah. Tertullian, yeah. which I, I would say it's, we should dismiss this quote also from the discussion. Hmm. <laughs> but that's very strong points now to get the discussion started, because this duality, which is uh, presupposed by most people who think about that, stems from high medieval times. It does not exist before the 13th century. Hmm. So all the, the whole tradition in philosophy, or how to say it now, <laughs> we don't have words for that. In the, in the first millennium, so to say, of Christianity has another connection between these terms. So theology is part of philosophy, and then it's called mystical philosophy or something like that and and faith is immanent to reason not a contradiction so it's it's a part of what belongs to rationality uh, and so on and so you can go through that and and this is presupposed or, or or this duality is not seen when we 
deal with these categories of Hellenization and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I propose to do instead of this is really to turn the tables quite resolutely mm -hmm. and to, to conceive of these traditions as part of a common ground. So, and then it depends on how we understand. Yeah, it's a, the German word Bildung has no clear reference in English, so it's always, <laughs> I prefer literacy, but literacy is a bit different and, and education is too narrow and yeah. a certain aspect and so on. You mean, the Greek paideia is the best word for that. So, yeah. so yeah. they have this common ground of paideia, they have this common ground of many ethical ideas they share, uh, they have this common ground of worldviews and philosophical ideas. And on this common ground, they refer to different traditions sometimes, though Christians refer to the Bible, which the, the others don't do. Um, and then they discuss certain questions, and sometimes they have the same questions, sometimes they have different questions, sometimes they gave quite similar or even the same answers, and sometimes they diverge into their ways how to deal with these questions and so on. And uh, I would make a case for this approach uh, to, to get a better historic view of what was going on in these decisive centuries of the you know, Roman Empire, so to say, in a way. Right. So this is my very big... <laughs> point now but i think if we start with this we are right in the middle of this discussion well thank you for that uh and i i do appreciate and you're right um harnack is not here to you know defend himself or to explain mm -hmm. himself so i i do appreciate uh it is true that his ideas are m more nuanced than the the very simple duality between the gospel and uh, Hellenism. Um, and I'm glad that you were the first one to talk and to put forward this, this uh, hypothesis of creating new categories, thinking about this completely differently, um, because I hope that this discussion would not just be about Harnack himself, or about um, his legacy, like the influence he's had, but also um, what we as scholars in patristics can do moving forward. Thank you, Alphonse, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Mark Schies, you're next. Uh, you're in Berlin where um, our friend Harnack was for a long time. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on this uh, Hellenization thesis? You've written a lot about this. Um, because I'm not able to counter-argue against Alphonse, I think I should um, explain some things about Harna, um, because it's no good idea to put a scholar of the 19th and early 20th century in the midst of our discussion and to have him as or, or to deal with him as a contemporary figure. Yes. He is deeply coined by a completely disappeared form of piety and world, the Baltic Lutheran um, form of Protestantism that never survived the catastrophes of the 20th century. Hmm. Uh, he was coined there. And um, if one is reading the passages, quite often the piety or whole Jesus is characterized by the wonderful word simple, the simple gospel of. And uh, one specific element uh, which um, distinguished Baltic Lutheran piety from Lutheran piety in most parts of Germany was the close link between pietism and Baltic Lutheran uh, piety. So the idea that every form of philosophy is something which is nice, but not necessary. Mm -hmm. That uh, the simple devotion, there is always in Harnack this word simple, the simple devotion to Jesus is what we only need. 
not these lots of dogmatics, um, the simple devotion of Jesus and uh, to the Father and our simple devotion to Jesus. Um, I think um, the, the interesting historical observation is that Harnack's form of piety, also this piety was deeply coined, as I said, by a specific today disappeared form of uh, Lutheran Protestantism, was um, compatible, not only compatible, was fitting in the liberal piety of the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. That, that's uh, one reason for the enormous success of Harnack. There is a wonderful um, letter by Loves to Harnack. You are absolutely conservative. Don't you realize that you are conservative? You are a hidden uh, pietist Lutheran in our liberal group. And that's a key to, to understand him. Um, as Alphonse said, th th there is no need to discuss whether this is a model which we can use today to describe development. Th th that's a fruitless um, question. I think the, the more interesting um, question is to, to bring Harnack again in our discussion, to ask the question, when we are looking to the uh, relation of uh, Christian thinkers to philosophy, what we are neglecting. Are there dimensions of early Christianity and Christianity in um, uh, imperial time, which we are missing when focusing the wonderful line from origin to the Cappadocians? Sure. And I think Harnack is to a certain extent, uh, how I can explain, can be saved when we ask the question, what about Jesus at the um, Lake Kinneret? Th that's a completely, uh, the, the Palestine in the first century was a completely Hellenized, so to say, culture. But obviously Jesus of Nazareth was no part of these Hellenized culture. He was not um, um, dealing with the people in the Hellenized cities, Tiberias and other parts. He lived in the more um, against this Roman culture oriented, um, again, pietistic circles. Th that's quite interesting. Um, and, and so uh, Harnack's duality is absurd, as Alphonse said, uh, nothing need to say, but Jesus of Nazareth had no contact with the Hellenized world. He never attended the theater in Sepphoris. He was not walking through the highly elegant streets of Tiberias. He was not sitting in the bath of Tiberias and taking Greek uh, teachings <laughs> to read the, the uh, Euripides or others. And um, Harnack's duel is highly problematic because Paul, <laughs> Paul uh, the, the way of ancient Christianity in the Greco-Roman culture was extremely fast. Um, but that at the beginning, uh, this is um, a culture which had certain distances. That's something wh where one can reformulate uh, Harnack's ideas. I'm, I'm always against, um, if it's quite clear, as Alphonse said, that this is no model we can use today, then it's an interesting question. Is there anything in Harnack um, which, um, which we can learn? And the, the first is um, the the beginnings of Christianity outside the, the Hellenistic world with Jesus it, in a counter culture. And the other thing is uh, that in observing the deep, um, how to say, coinage of Harnack's ideas um, because of his own Bildungsgeschichte and his own piety uh, to ask ourselves whether our reconstructions of early Christianity are in a certain way coined by our own worldviews, sure. that, that we are at uh, faculties of theology or of uh, departments of religion and are proud of to be part of such a culture which is in a certain way um, the heritage of 
the Greco-Roman culture and are proud that our arguments are heard and, and so on. So um, Alphonse is absolutely right. That there are certain ruins of Karnak and the, the provocative question is, is there anything what we can save uh, as a provocation for the discussion? And I think that Jesus is no one um, we can imagine in Alexandria, in, in the Kombo um, excavations. <laughs> he never ever would have attended one of these wonderful lecture halls in Alexandria. Definitely not. And to, 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 he is not a simple uh, man of devotion. So Jesus must be completely uh, differently modeled than Harnack thought. But the, the difference to the Greco-Roman culture in the beginnings um, brings us to the interesting observation how fast Christianity migrated in this culture uh, already in the first generation. And that's perhaps something uh, where Harna can help us to uh, face things more clearly. Uh, sorry for having <laughs> spoken so long. But, uh, the, the, the question is quite interesting. <laughs> You brought up a, a couple of interesting points or that I want to get back to. Um, uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to uh, get George and Ioannis in here. Um, and then we'll circle back to some questions from these uh, preliminary remarks. Thank you, Christoph, very much. Uh, Dr. Karamanilis, um, you're up. Well, th uh, thank you very much, John. Um, well, I. Um... I completely agree, and I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm not the first to speak. I completely agree with Alphonse and Christoph in sort of somehow um, rejecting this duality of sort of, Christ, sort of Christianity on the one hand, or kind of the pure form of Christianity on the one hand, and Hellenization on the other hand. I think Hanak was perhaps under the spell of a tendency in his at his in his time, namely to uh, the search for the for the origins for the original form, what the Germans call Orsprung. So I think that was also uh, uh, an, an age in which sort of in general in sort of philology in philosophy in ancient philosophy people were looking for the Orsprung, the, the origins of X, Y, Z, and one tempting idea was well let's find out what Christianity originally was. Mm -hmm. As Christoph uh, uh, Marx has uh, quite well said, I think it, it's, it's from, from very, very early on, right, from already from the first generation of, of Christians and Christian texts, we find there sort of Hellenic concepts, um, well, in, 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 in Paul's texts, and then in the early sort of Christian texts, in Justin and so on. So it's very difficult to uh, distinguish between sort of a pure or original form of Christianity, sort of kind of piety, so to speak, or sort of religious life on the one hand, and sort of a Hellenization, which means basically sort of a more philosophical uh, conception of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I think that is sort of uh, a mistake exactly because Christianity somehow appears in a certain historical context and somehow grows in that context and it is, it is somehow imbued by that context. Uh, and already the, 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 the early gospel, the gospels and the early texts are somehow, um, well, we find sort of concepts which are sort of concepts of sort of Greek, uh, the Greek conceptual apparatus. So I, I, I think that this is, um, this is sort of problematic. On the other hand, um, uh, uh, th there is something in that idea, namely that sort of Christianity is sort of uh, is a kind of um, a, a, a religion that really draws on many different resources and really tries to somehow profit from the discussions that are available and try somehow to make sense and is not really, does not remain at the level of sort of simple stories, but grows uh, very rapidly into something sort of different. Within a century or two, we have something, something very different from the uh, text of the first century. Mm -hmm. And that shows something about the dynamics of Christianity. Mm -hmm. 
that is sort of it's not just a religious like sort of Mithraism or I don't know uh, the, the 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 cult of Kibele or or, or or many other cults in the Greco-Roman Empire, but it's something really very dynamic and very sort of um, uh, progressive in a way that sort of tries to make sense of concepts and ideas put forward in the very early texts and make sense of them. So that is sort of a situation that calls for answers. How come Christianity grows so quickly? How come it somehow moves into so many directions? How come it becomes sort of philosophical from very early on? So, well, perhaps we don't, we have reasons not to like Harnack's idea, but I think this is an answer to uh, a question that Christianity itself somehow poses to us with its sort of incredibly uh, rapid growth. Thank you, George, very much for that. Ioannis? Well, thank you. As, as speak, speaking, speaking last in order, what remains for me, but to perhaps start defending Hanak a little. Um, <laughs> But I, I mean, obviously, uh, some of my colleagues have already started doing that. And I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to pick up where, where Christoph sort of left by, by really asking, you know, what is there uh, that could still be interesting for us? I mean, it goes without saying that I agree with a lot of the, the comments, the critical comments that my, my colleagues have made uh, be before me. Um, and that, that you know, Harnack's idea of the sort of simple gospel is in itself very simple. And that, um, I mean, something I think actually nobody said so far, but that this notion of the Greek spirit, I mean, there is a sort of essentialism that I think most scholars of antiquity would find very strange today and rightly rightly so, right? So th there's obviously a, a, lot of, a lot of stuff that's dated. But I wanted to raise one question that, in my view, isn't trivial at all, um, and it goes beyond the question of whether there's, a, there's there's an antithesis between Christianity and philosophy or between Christianity and culture. We remember what Hanak wanted to do in the history of dogma is is write a history, right? Is think about the development of Christian theology, we might say, of Christian doctrine. Now, it seems to me that there is a question that is not trivial at all, and that is, do we understand this development as a kind of organic growth that starts off with uh, obviously in some ways a simplified form, but then organically, logically grows from there to a much more complete, a much more explicit form, as we have it um, in a, a much much later, possibly, possibly even today. Now, obviously, answering that question at one level is a historical question, but at another level, it's not innocent at all because how we answer that question has a lot to do with how we think about Christianity uh, as such, right? And so it seems to me there are really two models, right? I mean, this, this, uh, th there's no, there's no doubt that if we think of the people who are very much associated with the model of a sort of organic growth from the beginning, like John Henry Newman in the 19th century, for example, uh, or on the on the Lutheran side, someone like Isaac Donner, or more recently, I think someone like Alois Grillmeier, um, there we have people who have very particular theological interests in pushing that narrative, namely to have a reason for saying that however different perhaps later stages of doctrine look, they're actually not disconnected from what happened at the very beginning. Now, it seems to me Harnack goes for a different model and the different and what and 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 I think the fundamental question he's asking stands even if we take leave of uh, many of his simplified categories. And the question is, is there is it really true that there is this kind of growth where you know where we have that, like a seed that's simply growing into a full plant? Or is it not perhaps the case that at several stages in the history, even of early Christianity, there are ruptures where something comes into being that is actually very different from what existed before. And it seems to me that Hanak, I mean, again, to, to look at him in his own context, he clearly uh, uh, argues to an extent against the models that have been informed by Hegelian 
um, views about organic development of history, he is very has a very keen eye for seeing the ruptures, the discontinuities. The late second century for him is a period where some version of Christianity comes into existence that in important ways is discontinuous with the Christianity that existed before. One could say the same about Christianity in the fourth century with Nicaea or in the fifth century. Now, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, this isn't in itself problematic. How do we actually conceptualize these discontinuities? But what I would, if, if I were to say, you know, where is Harnack still an important conversation partner? It's probably really by reminding us that it may be facile to settle on this organic growth model, which I, it seems to me in the past few decades has appealed to a lot of patristics um, uh, scholars for various, very different reasons, but it may not be um, as obviously true um, as, uh, uh, as, 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 as we may think. And if I may just to, 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 con to conclude, um, give one example that to my mind is very, very interesting. Um, I don't know whether uh, some or all of you have, have recently read the um, the fourth volume of Foucault's History of Sexuality, uh, which has only now been published. And I mean, Foucault doesn't mention Harnack at all, but if we look at how he understands early Christianity, it's very interesting that there's no author he cites prior to the late second century or the early third century. And I think there's a very simple reason. The simple reason is that what Foucault's interested in, which is Christianity as a kind of organized religion with a particular form of church and all that only comes into existence at that time. Right. And that's, of course, in some ways, also part of what, what Harnack argues for. It's not just dogma, but it is also a certain form of, of, of episcopal structure that emerges um, um, uh, at, at that point in time. So I think I think if we try to understand in our own time how Christianity has this dynamic that George spoke of, um, I think one difficult question we may want to remember from Harnack's work is to ask ourselves, where are the ruptures? Where are the discontinuities? Where do things suddenly continue in a way that cannot easily be deduced from what went on before? Yeah. Okay. Uh, may, may I add yeah, one, absolutely. Sentence, one sentence to, um, I'm Johannes, especially thankful for that remark concerning the ruptures, because it helped me to understand a, a handwritten sentence by Harnack, which I had always difficulties to understand. There is an article in the Harnack Festschrift by Trolsch, where Trolsch interpreted Harnack from Bauer. And Harnack has written in uh, his own copy, which is kept in the faculty library in Berlin, this is the most correct interpretation of what I thought. And I always thought there are so many differences to Bauer. Why he is so, uh, is it because of a personal relation to Trolsch? But uh, following the lane uh, Johannes uh, has pointed out, um, it's not only the ruptures, it's also rupture and continuity. Um, Hellenism is not the real break. It's a development. It's a natural development. There, there is always the Goethe idea of organic developments. So Harnack is to a certain extent a friend of a synthesis uh, because rupture alone would be a caricature of Protestantism. The Catholics for organic development, Second Vatican uh, as the development, and, so, and the Protestants for rupture. No, uh, th th that's all so a very simplistic model. Harnack provokes those folks in, in the history of ancient Christianity today, always interested in the ruptures to look for the continuities. And those folks 
in, in our discipline, still interested in the continuities to look for the ruptures. And perhaps his specific modernity today is not uh, Alphonse and, and George, it, all thing is said concerning the absurdities and simplicities and so, but the provocation, the friends of the rupture are uh, uh, have to look for the organic development, that, that's the, the Bauer heritage. Yeah. And uh, the, the others, that's this specific um, Baltic um, rupture interest. We have nothing to do with the Russian Orthodox people and we have nothing to do with the Catholics. We are proud uh, uh, Baltic Protestants and can stand alone and there is a rupture. It, it's, so these two dimensions in Harnack and that's perhaps something we can use. Uh, the, the half of Harnack for the friends of continuity and organic development and half of Harnack for the friends of rupture, that, that that's a possible use of him uh, today when we are modeling. George, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the surprising um, uh, rapid de development uh, of certain Christianities in, in the first century, in the second, third century, th there is always a speed in that that uh, Kozelik's idea of that speed is characteristic uh, of modernity um, th then uh, and Christianity brings in speed as sign of modernity in antiquity. I like this uh, notion of, of the ruptures. It <clears throat> reminds me, you know, in the, the 12th and 13th century saw a rupture in Western Europe, you know, as cities begin to emerge and to um, get this urbanization and with it, the universities. And at the University of Paris, you know, in the 13th century, of course, people like Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure were accused of being Aristotelians uh, more so than Christians. So there, this goes back long before Harnack, as Alphonse said, uh, it has a long and illustrious history. This this um, duality between an original pure form of Christianity and say uh, Greek uh, thought. Um, one rupture <clears throat> that might be hard to detect, you know, as I was um, working on my dissertation on origins, homilies on the Psalms, oh, excuse me, I've got bad allergies. Um, there's a, he's it's in his first homily on psalm 77 and he's uh thinking about he's he's starting with the verse uh from the psalm psalm 77 or 78 in modern bibles i will open my mouth in parables and utter problems from of old and he he links to a textual uh discrepancy in one of the gospel in one of the copies of matthew's gospel where the copyist, the scribe, had inserted the name Isaiah in Matthew 13, 35. Um, so instead of just saying, um, uh, so in order that what the prophet said might be fulfilled, I will open my mouth in parables and utter problems from of old, the copy said, uh, in order that what um, the prophet Isaiah said might be fulfilled, well, Origen recognized that Jesus in this passage is not quoting anything from Isaiah. He's quoting Psalm 77, which was a psalm of Asaph. And that got me thinking. So the Gospel of Matthew, I'm not sure the exact dates. When is it usually around like the 80s or 90s when it was thought that was written? Or is it more closer to the turn of the second century, give or take? Um, that text has Jesus quoting the Greek text of the Psalms. Now, is that an editorial? Uh, or would Jesus actually have been reading and quoting the Septuagint? Isn't this the problem with uh, historical sources? Because... Jesus didn't write anything. We don't have anything from his original hand. Um, certainly by the time the Gospel of Matthew was written, 
there's that connection and, and the Septuagint text is used instead of the Hebrew. But isn't this a part of this problem of identifying a pure form of Christianity that we, it's a problem of sources? No? I, I think it's quite clear what the status of Hellenization uh, in Palestine in the fourth century is. So to use Hellenization as an ensemble of uh, knowledge of Greek language, um, but also a certain quality of life. Uh, Qumran is definitely a community where a lot of Greek texts, I, I remember when the Huntington Library volumes were published, and I suddenly realized the large number of Greek texts in Qumran, uh, which were in the editions before, uh, in, in the Oxford edition, um, to a certain extent marginalized. Now, it's quite clear what's the status of Hellenization, and it's also quite clear um, by, by the um, small villages, Jesus is, most of them are excavated. We know about Korazim, we know about Capernaum and so forth. Jesus is avoiding the large Hellenized cities. And he is probably avoiding those large Hellenized cities and um, using the um, of not Hellenized countryside because the religious milieu in which he was um, part of had a certain distance to those Jewish groups Hellenized. But, but this is only something which can be said about he himself, his pupils, obviously went immediately after his death in the Hellenized cities and began. The, the Gospels are a product, as George said. So it, it's only a question of the beginnings. And I think the, the, the interesting question, was this a quite natural development or others that, as Johannes said, that there are certain models. And we, we are always asking the question how the, let's say, early Alphonse, in his first works is related to the Alphonse today and, and uh, when he will be retired, how the late Alphonse is related to his Regensburg beginnings. And then there are two models, continuity or the break model. And um, it's far more interesting to, to portray him according to a break model. But my impression is there, there is always a large continuity of Alphonse and developing uh, certain things. So the, the question whether the specific distance of Jesus to the Hellenized, a certain distance to the Hellenized world, um, that he is avoiding the Decapolis cities, that he is avoiding T Tiberias, Sepphoris, and all these other cities, that, that's a specific of him. And uh, we, we can happy that Christianity uh, has developed. Uh, otherwise, it would have be probably died out. <laughs> <laughs> Alphonse, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, because Christoph mentions again the two points brought up by you and Johannes and, and George as well. I think one problem in this is that what we have are these texts. And I agree that uh, the interesting point is the question about Jesus. But we can infer our picture of Jesus only out of these texts. So uh, th this is always an interpretation which we cannot avoid. And of course, obviously, he did not speak Greek, so he could not quote the Septuagint. <laughs> so, but all the early texts are written, written in Greek. Uh, and what you say, Christoph, yes, I agree. This is the world of Jesus, no? the countryside of Galilee, Galilee and so on. Uh, but maybe there are some traces also in it where he has some contacts to, to the Hellenized world. The, this women from Tyre and, uh, and so on, and fees to pay to the emperor and, and so on. Uh, so the, the question is, again, how do we set up it? Did he consciously avoid these other places? Or is it simply the case that he grew up in this milieu and he moved in the milieu which he knows from his childhood. 
uh, and so on. Because if we if we not trust these <laughs> these texts, uh, what he's doing then with uh, what we call now Old Testament, so with the Hebrew tradition and interpreting it and rearranging it in this way, if it's not all done simply by Paul and the evangelists or the authors of these texts, so he must have been a highly trained rabbi or something like that. So he must have had a certain education, which is, of course, not the Hellenic education of, of Paideia, but this is not a kind of simple man walking around in the villages and saying nice, nice things. This is highly highly sophisticated, what, what's going on there. So, so, and then we come again close to a kind of, uh, yeah, bigger world in this uh, period, uh, or maybe in brackets, we can co compare it maybe a little bit with Socrates. He wrote nothing. What we know it depends on Plato and uh, and so on. And then we have uh, some idea about Socrates, but which is very different from what Plato did and founding an academy in a very highly social, highly ranked, established institution, and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so, so there is really a problem how to conceive of Jesus, but I agree that there is this rapidly development, rapid development from what we obviously see, where Jesus lived and what he did and what his uh, followers did immediately after his death. No, they started differently. And only one second remark to this rupture or, uh, or not and so on. Mm. My, my view of early Christianity is more uh, chaotic. <laughs> so it's a kind of nearly chaos. <laughs> so a high plurality, what we see, you called it, Christoph, sometimes a laboratorium, so laboratory. laboratory. I, I would add that with the difference that they meant it very seriously. <laughs> they are, what, what they did not only, oh, let's try it another, another way. But, but this is true, and for me, it's more this high plural form, which we can detect already in the earliest writings, you know, the Pauline letters in itself, and then four Gospels, and so on and so on, all the Gnostic groups and others. And only later on, we see <clears throat> that some major traditions grew out of this chaotic uh, beginnings and, and the problem is always that as historians when we look back we we we, we construct these these lines <laughs> and then then we call it development or rupture like Eusebius you know, the first who did this uh, so so I would prefer this idea more of plurality and chaotic groups spreading <laughs> out of nothing, it seems, in this world and dealing with these traditions and the influences they had. So th these were my two remarks on that. Uh, I, Ioannis, I think your hand was up first, if I'm not mistaken. Well, let's let's assume it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel I feel we're kind of really right in the middle of a number of incredibly interesting questions, and I would sort of perhaps say, you know, it just goes to show that the legacy of Hannah can't easily be written off because it helps us sort of get right to the point of some vexing questions in the historiography of early Christianity that aren't at all resolved in our own time. I mean. If, if I may just come back to this is, issue of, of continuity and discontinuity, a, a plurality, yeah. chaotic plurality, um, I honestly don't even think that I disagree that you know Christoph um, Alphonse and I dis disagree on on mm. on on that at, at all, um, and I I especially really <laughs> agree with with the uh, the example that that Christoph used about you know people thinking about the early. Uh, whatever um, Heidegger and the late Heidegger, whatever you know, and 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 it is in the, it's in the eye of the beholder whether we see the continuity or the discontinuity. Absolutely, I think where the reason I think the question isn't trivial is because it is just so natural for us to 
read earlier developments in the light of later developments. And I think at least my own experience from having now done this kind of historical work for a, quite a while is that it's kind of much harder um, to get this out of the system than we think. I mean, we just we just assume that we assume I mean, it's, it's even it's even in the use of it's even in the use of of terminologies, right? Like church or bishop or theology or doctrine. Um, and and you know when I when I teach patristics to my students um, at Oxford, I mean one of the first things I always tell them is you know the reason it's so hard is that the categories we need to use because we don't have any other categories have to be always queried when we we talk about that time because they were only kind of emerging at the time and so in a way we have to kind of look over our own shoulders the whole time and ask ourselves to what extent is this category actually helpful or not when we're talking about something let's say in the in the in, in the in the famous laboratory of the of the second century and even more of course if we try to understand um the jesus movement or however we want to call that and i think that's why i think this question of continuity and discontinuity is perhaps a little more than simply just a game uh, where we see, you know, look at it this way and it's continuous, look at it another way and we see the, 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 the rupture. I think there is a real problem of historical hermeneutic that makes it so hard for us to understand Jesus. Well, I mean, that's very hard. And uh, even, even if we, you know, we accept the analogy with Socrates, um, which people in antiquity uh, already saw, um, you know, it's hard to understand Socrates, of course, you know, there's a huge literature on that and now people actually closer uh, to, to really understanding. And the, and, and, the, and the reason is that we're kind of trying to look behind a veil. Um, that's very hard to, to pierce. And I think the same is not just true for Jesus himself. I would perhaps push a little against a view that says, well, there's just Jesus who is a who is a bit of a, a, a mystery, and after that everything becomes clear. I think really understanding some of the main writings of the New Testament and possibly even sort of texts in the up to the middle of the second century, still very, very difficult because in some ways perhaps because it's so chaotic. I mean, chaos is hard to understand elephants, right? Isn't it? I mean, because mm -hmm. it's so chaotic and because in some ways the kind of dominant, predominant uh, categories that emerge in the third and fourth centuries um, with figures like origin give us a sort of guardrails that help us understand things that perhaps we don't understand initially. But if we try to understand how people thought or how people acted or, uh, prior to that time without these guardrails, it's just it's just very hard. And I think at that point, it it matters whether we think okay, some author operating in the early second century basically already thinks like origin even though they don't i mean you know that's what you read in published literature they thought basically the same way except they didn't have the developed terminology um and so obviously we can't really ask do they have a, a nicene doctrine of the trinity but we can assume that perhaps they had a doctrine they had a trinitarian theology that was an analogous um to that um and i think that's you know i'm not saying that's impossible but but it obviously means we're kind of constantly importing a, a massive theological ideological philosophical conceptual baggage into a period of time about we know just just very little oh. mm -hmm. christoph oh you're muted um, Alphon's idea to bring in the uh, concept of plurality is quite wonderful because um, th th there is a certain danger, and I think th that's a Harnackian mousetrap, not to distinguish between Hellenization as a term linked to questions of paideia, as, as Alphonse said, and Greco-Roman culture. 
And there, there is a striking um, example. When looking to the subscription list of the Council of Calcido, there is a subscription of the Bishop of Gadara. Gadara is a city of the Decapolis. Gadara is a highly uh, uh, coined by Greco-Roman culture city, bathhouses, a wonderful church, and so and so. The bishop is not able to write. His deacon has to sign for him. He is an illiterate. So um, is he part of the Greco-Roman culture? Obviously. <laughs> Probably. He, he lived in the city. He was involved, but he was an illiterate don't know why they elected him. We don't know anything about him, whether he was an ascetic and so impressive that they thought we should elect him or, or whatever. And so um, th this form of plurality, um, never, we have always these great narratives in the sense from plurality to unity. And th that's uh, in the same way as the, the break or organic development, these are these large narratives. And uh, I have always the impression it's a question of the microscope. Uh, if we use the microscope, there is such a lot of plurality that there are still in, in a time where paideia is such an ideal for Christianity in large cities and Gadara, the uh, Nicomachos of Gadara, that's a learned city, that's a city full of Paideia with a lot of Greek philosophy, but the bishop is uh, not able to write with his hand uh, his name. So, so um, my impression is um, that we should train ourselves to, to realize this plurality and not to model. Um, Jesus of Nazareth is obviously um, someone more, I understand him, but there, there is, as I once said, a, a serious source problem. And if we cannot trust the sources, then we are in a very <laughs> bad situation. But obviously a prophet, um, formulating certain senses. When looking to um, explanation of scripture, what, what then um, uh, brought uh, a street to the rabbinic Judaism, uh, he, he is separated from. That, that's not uh, th this form of learned discussion as in certain, th th there is a certain apocalyptic element in a prophet's element, a wonder worker element. So, so it's, so it's a, a person which is difficult to comparable or to express it the other way around, which offered a lot of options to continue. <laughs> there, there were uh, lots of options one could follow. And as Alphonse said, that there was definitely a, a Weisheitslehrer, teacher of um, a, a certain form uh, of, of sapientia, which allowed the um, friends of Paideia in the later centuries to continue. I want to get. Uh, I want to address this issue of sources here a, a little bit more. <clears throat> um, but first, this this illiterate bishop is fascinating. Is it? Isn't there, if I remember right, uh, a transcript of um, uh, an interrogation of a Christian church in Oxyrhynchus, Egypt, um, where they were wondering, uh, the authorities were wondering where their books were, and isn't there a reference to? A lector who is agramatoi, uh, mm -hmm. illiterate, which makes me think, you know, what? How could a lector be illiterate? What were they trying to do with this? Is it but because, the lector, but because uh, he, he was familiar with the gospel by heart? There is the wonderful um, um, edition of papyri ordination testimonies of late antiquity by Gregor Schmelz. And the prerequisition to be ordinated uh, is to know one gospel by heart. So, sure. so obviously a lot of people ordained were illiterates and were only able to uh, proclaim the gospel by heart and to imagine how during, I don't know, 20 years, uh, the, the variations in the gospel mm -hmm. of, don't know, uh, Matthew in, in a, a, a small village church changed, but 
that is not an attempt to uh, how to say to reduce the the influx of paideia in christian theology or philosophy in in late antiquity it's it's only um an, an argument for alphonse plurality it, yeah. it's it's always a chaotic plurality and there are certain instances trying to arrange to order to hierarchize but uh, life is chaotic Yes, that, that's right. And just to add to that, you know, uh, one thing, I don't think Harnack addressed it. Did, did he really address the the Syriac or Armenian traditions? I mean, one would think um, that it was just Greek and, and maybe some Latin, but uh, we forget that there are all these other languages, too, that emerge in early Christianity that complicate the picture more. But of course, in, in, interestingly, um, I mean, I, I was actually thinking of that earlier, and I think it's fair to say that, that I mean, one way in uh, one area in which patristics has covered an enormous amount of new ground in the 20th century is in the discovery of these Eastern mm -hmm. Christianities. I mean, Harnack himself had Armenian students, so I think he was actually quite well informed okay. there. But what's interesting, um, and in some ways one could see it's it's perhaps a little bit of supporting Harnack's own idea, you know, when, um, so these Christianities outside the Roman Empire it, it, it emerge also very early on, but then later on, when they develop the kind of theologies that then become sort of characteristic for them. I mean, they, this all happens. I mean, it, there is a sense of Greek learning, right? I mean, these people from the Syriac world often go to Alexandria and study there. The Armenians in the sixth and seventh centuries translate Greek theology into their own language. So, I mean, I said earlier that in some ways, you know, this 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 Harnack's concept of Greek culture is is problematic as as a kind of essentialism, and and I think several people here have said you know this is this a kind of variety of phenomena um not we're not just talking about philosophy you know what what can fall under this umbrella on the other hand perhaps people in antiquity would have recognized something that can be uh, characterized as hellenismos as you know as as greek culture would i mean obviously that's not a word that, that they would have used and perhaps just to perhaps you know it's, perhaps it's my my job here to provoke people a bit um i mean one interesting question for kind of despisers of hana would be i mean the, the early christians themselves used the term greeks in a negative way right um even though they all speak greek or most or many of them do right i mean there's all these kind of this literature against the greeks um, which means against the pagans. But, you know, why do they use the term Greeks um, if, you know, if they, apart from some crazy individuals such as Tertullian, didn't really see there was a distinction between Christianity and, 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 and Greek culture? I mean, I'm, I'm really just throwing this in here, not by seeing, you know, this is the way it is, but Perhaps, you know, somebody said earlier, you know, Harnack isn't here to, to defend himself. Perhaps if he were, that might be something he would say. Is that, well, actually, throughout patristic literature, we frequently find this, in a way, really intriguing use of the term uh, Hellenos um, uh, or Hellenismos for, you know, where we are tempted to translate pagan. Um, for for something that uh, uh, that that Christianity sort of pitching itself against uh, both Greeks and Jews, right, is 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 very often the way um, uh, um, Christians, uh, you know, neither neither Jew nor nor Greeks is sort of how how, how Christians understand themselves. Um, you wanna, one sec, Christoph. You want to you anticipated me there quite a bit. You got into the question that I wanted to ask the group, but before I do that. <clears throat> Christoph, you had your hand up. Yes, um, the 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 way Harnack looked to the non-Latin and Greek-speaking Christianity is in the way ambivalent. A lot of things are ambivalent in him. Um, ambivalent, uh, a Baltic Pietist and a liberal. Ambivalent, 
developing organic in a Goethean way and uh, facing the ruptures because he, he was interested in the Armenians because his hope was to uh, create a Protestant liberal reformed church in the Oriental Orthodox yeah. churches. Um, but th th that's one direction. But the other direction is there is a lot in Texte und Untersuchungen uh, and, and in uh, publications he brought to the Hinrichs publishing house uh, of Armenian and Syriac texts. Uh, his interest to um, create a position for Carl Schmidt and the edition of unknown Coptic texts. So um, th th there is always this in between. He hierarchized. Greek is more interesting. The, the Latin are, uh, and Greek texts in the GCS, the other things in Texte und Untersuchung. But um, I remember how shocked I was to, to name an admired uh, scholar, Peter Brown, who said the third world of early Christianity when speaking on Armenian, Greek, and Coptic Christianity. So uh, we are all trained in, in, in uh, high schools and gymnasia, but where it's quite clear, first we, we took the Greek Plato, and then we look for the Syriac, Coptic, uh, and other texts. That, that's a training and a question of capacity and professionalization. But this ambivalence of Harnack, that, that's, I think, something um, which uh, links uh, a, a lot which linked a lot of things we have touched uh, in in our talk uh, this afternoon oh george well i, I just uh, want to say one thing namely um that uh, hopefully links with what johannes and uh, christoph have just said namely that uh, well, Christianity from very early on somehow joined forces with the rest of antiquity in the so-called late antiquity in preserving a large amount of what we have from antiquity nowadays. Namely, the period of late antiquity has, well, has its own works, but it also preserves so much from sort of classical and Hellenistic times, preserves so much of antiquity and sort of Christianity does the same. There are so many sort of uh, 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 quotations from ancient authors in early Christians and so many sort of uh, 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 citations that are so valuable for us in early Christian texts. So that is sort of a, a something that, uh, well, clearly uh, Harnack spots, namely that there is a kind of a veneer namely that uh, the, the Hellenic culture somehow is present in the early Christian text from very early on. If you look at Clement uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, a number of all the, those early Christian texts, the, the amount of uh, citation from the pre-Socratics, from uh, so Plato, Aristotle, from Stoics and, uh, and, from, uh, and, Stoics and, and Pyrrhonians is so high. And that is exactly what we found also in texts non-Christian texts of the same time. That is so that sort of Christianity somehow is aligned with sort of the spirit of its time, namely of namely venerating or somehow, or not venerating, but somehow setting himself itself in dialogue with antiquity and preserving a, a part of antiquity. And that is, uh, makes Christianity to some extent part of the mainstream of what we find in late antiquity namely in sort of text of the commentators to Aris of, of Aristotle and so on. Oh. Alphonse. No, you you want to bring up another question, but I would like to pick up. What Absolutely. Was, yes, yes, go for was it. it. It was in my mind earlier to bring up a new <clears throat> aspect of this question, uh, because I agree with what George said. And Usually, we deal with these questions in terms of looking at influences from antiquity on early Christianity, or from the other side, that Christian groups or Christian people who well educated, the elite of Christianity, participated in this paideia world of antiquity. But this is only the elite, the, the literate ones. No, we have a social distinction here. Uh, and there are groups who resisted these influences, monastic groups or, or something like that. But what we could also do uh, in this picture drawn by George now 
we could ask about influences of Christianity on the ancient world. Uh, and this is a, to my surprise, this is a question rarely posed. And, uh, but it might be more interesting to look from this actually antique perspective. So this is going on in antiquity. These are the texts, traditions, ideas, and so on. And now something new in a way uh, is coming into this world based on a shadowy figure like Jesus, <laughs> which obviously was the inspiration for, for all that. Uh, and then they, they deal with these problems and questions uh, uh, themselves using ancient pagan traditions, sometimes criticizing them, uh, quite often or heavily criticizing the philosophers or something like that. But, but on the next page, doing the same thing with their own <laughs> means and, and now using biblical, biblical texts. So this might be a new perspective on that. And really to ask, no, what are they doing now? And this is, Johannes, how I understood uh, the, the fourth volume of Foucault. Because he has done this concept of the self and so on, and the care of the self in earlier traditions, uh, and now in this unfinished <laughs> late work, uh, he he tries to do this with Christian texts in a, for me, quite fascinating way. Okay. Uh, and this would be a, an approach to, to see now what is Christianity doing in these ancient contexts? And then we get out of this always... Here we have an influence, or oh, this is Platonic, and this is anti-Platonic, or oh, this is Hellenic, or, or not, uh, and and we deal with the real, the the concrete problems. Mm -hmm. So what do they think about body and soul? And then we have different different ideas on that. Um, sorry, if I could very quickly just just um, mm -hmm. come back to that because I, um, oh sorry, am I interrupting you? No, no, no. Uh, no okay. Um, because I mean, no, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely fascinated by by this the, by the work of the late Foucault. It is just very, very interesting that where he talks about these ideas in early Christianity, the couple of people who never who never get a mention of, for example, Jesus, or indeed early Christianity, any New Testament passages absent, or Judaism, none of that's there. And, and that's no what I'm saying. It's, it's, no so it's, it's very, it's very interesting. <laughs> it's very and and if you now, of course, you can always say, well, you know, he couldn't do everything, and he's obviously, perhaps, he could should have worked on that another decade, and he died instead. Um, but um, but but I mean, it, I came to the conclusion that it's no coincidence that somehow he starts with people like Clement, um, because he can find be, because. Because at the same time, you know, Foucault's understanding of history, in some ways, of course, it's the exact opposite of what Hanak wants to say. But Foucault's understanding of history is there's Greek antiquity, Roman antiquity, Christian antiquity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and so and so, um, uh, uh, you know, why is it that in a lodge in a in a in a in a perspective? where all that matters is how antiquity is being transformed one step after another till we get to the Middle Ages and then ultimately to the post-Tridentine period, which I think is massively fascinating to him, especially in France, um, that Christianity becomes a factor beginning with figures of the late second and early third century. Now, Foucault himself doesn't tell us why that is, but I mean, I, I must admit that when I myself arrived at that point, it made me think of Harnack. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, it made me think of Harnack because it seems to me that perhaps there is something there where you could see certain a certain kind of questions being asked, a certain kind of ideas being developed. Um, but any, anyway, so, sorry, just just yeah, because yeah, you brought up Foucault. And I really, I mean, I just wanted to make sure, I uh, wanted to make clear that I am utterly fascinated uh, by, by this work. And, it, and, and, it, and, and, and I think it is a legitimate perspective. Uh, and I just think from a heuristic point of view, it's interesting to observe who 
is cited in this work and and who isn't yeah so you put a reason why origin is not used although he would provide it a lot of stuff for his, <laughs> for his exactly book. i mean of course it's it's, it's unfinished and he died yeah. before that so we cannot say it definitely so, so. Al alphonse you brought up a really interesting question because this the idea of influence is pervasive in in our scholarship um it's also very it, it, it's a very difficult question. It's, it's very difficult to prove lines of influence, but you asked the question, did these early Christians of these first centuries have any influence at all on their, on their uh, non-Christian contemporaries? Was that the kind of question you were getting at a, a new form that, or is it a bit different than that? Oh, I think if you ask this way, I think we have to distinguish between two levels. Because it's always very hard to detect uh, precise influences of any Christian text on the contemporaries of the author. So right. if we ask who who read the apologies, <laughs> or did they have any any impact on so, or or other things, we, we, maybe we can say it uh, in a case like Augustine, who was read by many people and so on. But this is always very hard to detect. All this strange question whether Origen had some influence on late Platonists like Proclus or something like that. Yeah. Usually th these are very weird yeah. lines of thought. So, but another level, it, it's more, I, I, I'd say, in terms of uh, history of ideas. So that we can do this on the level of practical life, for instance, on ethics. Now we see some ethical values, especially in the Roman world. And if you read Tertullian, what he proposes for widows and, and of behavior of wives and so on, of women, then uh, you, you can get the idea that he he's the better Roman, <laughs> the better conservative Roman than the others and so on. Uh, or do we have really some influences on ethical behavior? Which is a very tricky question because I think it's not that big as we might assume <laughs> uh, from the side of Christians, or how to deal with the body or concepts of the body, or only to to mention what I worked on on this question of decision, freedom, and free will, and so on, that you see that the the early Christians and then especially Origen participate in this debate going on in the the Roman Empire, and they come up with some new ideas and bring into the discussion new ideas, which had some consequences in, later on. So I mean more this level on the history of ideas, not this um, practical level. Yeah. May any pagan has read some Christian work. Porphyry, Celsus read the Bible. And right. Porphyry, I, I'm sure that Porphyry read Origin. Uh, but but these are this is another level of this question uh christoph before you go i just have i i just want to ask one follow-up question is is that okay to alphonse yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> so uh freedom and and uh you and, and christian hengstrom have talked about this the metaphysics of freedom and the contribution of origin in this debate is I'm not exactly sure. You guys can answer this question for me. Uh, but in von Arnim's um, Stoicorum Veterum Fragmenta, doesn't he use um, uh, Book Three of uh, On First Principles, Three One of On First Principles, where Origen talks about the sources of movement? Doesn't von Arnim use that as um, evidence of a Stoic argument? Doesn't he put that yes, as a line of yes, he, yes, he does, and he uses this treatise and he uses contra and so on because you you can exploit it for many stoic ideas and concepts but as already susan boxin has shown in her book that uh, even uh, e even if we can detect now these stoic influences uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, then it's very tricky because um 
obviously origin uses the whole stoic theory of agency so he, basically it's all in, in origin mm -hmm. uh, not only in the principes and contract sells them as well but if he uses then the word uh, eloiteria has prohairesivas it has a quite different meaning from what you can find in earlier Stoics. Oh. And usually, we you can find in literature that people see, oh, here is the word prohiresis, and then what they, they think is, is it Aristotelian sense, or is it Epictetus, oh. and something like that. But the idea that it might have become a new uh, meaning <laughs> is, is not on the table. But this is shown already by Susan Bobzin, and she has only in a footnote, she, she makes a very interesting remark that uh, when in late antiquity, these Platonists use these story terms, then we can clearly detect these story terms and concepts, but they have a different meaning in a different framework. And this is what's interesting. So this is very complicated and you have to go very... Uh, precisely to the relevant texts to detect this. But the main point, what you what you have in, even in footnotes of many works and so on, what we are always doing, now people see something in the text and then they say, oh, this is Stoic, this is Platonic, uh -huh. this is Aristotelian. Uh -huh. this, this is only putting labels on that, yeah. yes. but not explaining what's going on. And the second question is the important one. That this is the work of uh, Susan Bobzin, uh, Determinism and Freedom in Stoic Philosophy. Oh, okay, okay. So, so she worked for oh, half of her life on that topic, and it's this is a fascinating book. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. Okay, that was your <laughs> okay. question. <laughs> Christoph. Um, my remark is related to what Alphonse said in his first remark. Um, with the category influence, th there are certain problems. One of the problems is that the clear-cut citation regulations against plagiarism in contemporary <laughs> time yes. are definitely not the rules in antiquity. But the second problem is, and in our talk on Harnack's legacy, this is also quite interesting. There is the mousetrap of a very traditional history of ideas. And uh, the, a very traditional history of dogma as history of ideas concept before the Cambridge uh, interventions and other things um, would marginalize th that not only, as Alphonse said, not only concepts were taken up by uh, non-Christian groups, but also institutions, um, certain behaviors of life, uh, how to deal with children, how to deal with a circus, um, how to deal with a patronage. And uh, I think only when asking, when moving away this influence question for, from these basket idea, stoic influence, <laughs> platonic influence, to a more um, life-oriented um, philosophy is is a is a life uh, is a form of life, and so we can discuss the influence question not uh, in our bookish way of dealing with philosophy. That that, that would be um, following the 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 Harnack ideas before Ado and others wrote, and the uh, Cambridge uh, uh, history of ideas uh, definition. Johannes? Yeah, I wanted to take up Alphonse's point in a sort of slightly a slightly different way because, you know, after I've now spent the past 90 minutes defending Harnack mostly, I think I think where I'd entirely agree he is, he is he's sort of, well, defective isn't even the word, is that, of course, you know, you can't really consult him if you want to understand how there is, you know, 
whether there's something like Christian philosophy, because he doesn't believe that such a thing even even exists. And in some ways, interestingly, one could say Hanuk is, even though he is so liberal, part of a part of a very theological approach to um, early Christian history of dogma, right? Because he thinks of it as something that is in an ideal world separate from the world of philosophy and is separate from um, a, a sort of non-Christian, non-religious, non-ecclesial um, 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 ideas or practices. And it's very interesting if we if we uh, if we sort of push deeper into the history of our discipline, um, you know, when does that actually start? I mean, one could say it has something to do with the common root of the history of doctrine and the history of philosophy in in some seventeenth century figures like like Ralph Cudworth and others. You know, at that time, it's perfectly acceptable, interestingly, to write about antiquity in a way. That actually does a lot of the things that 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 Alphonse and others here have have been saying, where the Christian ideas and their non-Christian ideas, and somehow they're all part of a of a, of a cultural um, 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 well, I don't know, a cultural entity or unity. Um, and then, in terms of disciplinary history, these uh, these paths kind of separated. And uh, and and on the one hand, we have the history of philosophy, which gets defined by, in a way, excluding a lot of a lot of theological ideas. I I, I mean, I I don't know whether George would agree with that, but it seems to me that that's partly really what happens. Uh, that there is an especially from from Hegel and the nineteenth century onwards a very strict view of a sort of what a philosophical canon is, and in a way. Um, religious thinkers, whether they are Christian or Jewish or Muslim, don't really fit the bill any longer. Um, um, uh, and, and in a way, at the same time, partly possibly even as a response to that, you have a consolidation of theological historiography, history of doctrine, that that in some ways tries to um, 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 limit itself to um, to Christian ideas understood very narrowly and 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 where I 100% agree really with with what what Alphonse said the question of how did these different ideas play out in the same cultural context um falls by the wayside um over the past 250 years now almost um, due to the way these different disciplines emerge and how they define what's kind of their purpose uh, to to study, and by definition or by implication, therefore also what's no longer part of their job to to consider. And I really think and hope that one way we can actually step out of that history today or move beyond or perhaps back to where it once was is to readdress these issues and i mean quite a few people on this chat i would say have been doing a lot of work uh, really to 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 get there and I, I i would i would i would be the first to say that's really where we'd like to where we ought to step out of the out of the shadow uh, harnack and others um, have cast because there is a kind of narrowing of the perspective of what even counts as 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 um, you know, as the history of Christian doctrine, and and then um, certain questions can't even be articulated, let alone answered. There, there is one historical mystery for me in understanding Harnack, and that is that the Berlin, the Prussian Academy, edited during his lifetime the wonderful series of commentaries in Aristotle. So he could have easy access to late antique philosophy. And probably he got by Hermann Diels the information. Dear friend, we have edited, don't know, Timistios or Alexander of Aphrodisias. 
And the, 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 the interesting thing is there is a lot of letter exchange with uh, Theodor Mommsen on philological details of inscription. We, we, we must a little bit avoid to portray Harnack as a systematic theologian in the dress of a historian. He, he did a lot of historical work, source critical work. And, and there, there is the wonderful Overbeck uh, characterization as the blacksmith of hypotheses. Um, so, so, but, but the mystery is why on earth no interest in the lot of interesting um, neoplatonic um, uh, text editions and commentaries of his deals was interested to propose him as secretary. So deals was obviously friendly to him. Th that's a mystery. And here my explanation is he, he is coined by this wonderful Baltic way of not necessary. It's nice. He was obviously fascinated by Nietzsche and with his friend uh, as a student, Gabriel Bunge, he exchanged a lot of letters where he was deeply fascinated by Nietzsche and uh, he, he was interpreting Martian concerning the question, the Übermensch term of Nietzsche was uh, of any interest for them. But Nietzsche was, and, and Nietzsche to a certain extent, was also an anti philosophic philosopher. So, so um, he, he looked for traditions avoiding this, and that uh, made him not, I would say, well prepared to uh, address the question Christianity and philosophy. I mean, perhaps one thing one could see, and again, I mean, George may know this better, but I mean, to the best of my knowledge, Deals and these people had no interest in these uh, uh, commentators either. I mean, they edited the texts because the texts contained important fragments of the pre-Socratics and of the Stoics, which one couldn't find anywhere else. And so most of the interest that anybody at the time had in these commentators was really as a, as a kind of um, as as a kind of source uh, that would help you uh, get to the fragments of earlier authors that you really wanted to uh, to get. I mean, the number of studies published at the time that are really dedicated, let's say, to to Themistius or or anyone, even Alexander of Aphrodisias, I think, is really tiny. Okay. So perhaps we shouldn't be too too critical of Harnack um, in, yeah, but, in, but, in, but in that was, He was so interested in new Christian texts. Oh. That's the interesting thing. When, when Karl Schmidt came with uh, an apocalypse fragment in the Coptic language, he was deeply interested in. When certain new Greek texts came out, he was deeply interested. So I think you are absolutely right with deals, no interest in Timistius as Timistius, but um, also texts from antiquity and so so that the, there was obviously a certain direction of the interest concerning as you have said johannes christianity christianity as an isolated high peak phenomenon of uh, development near to god uh, and uh, distant uh, from earthly life and text production and philosophy you know, and um, one thing we haven't really talked about at all is um, the liturgy and, and how uh, early Christian worship um, was expressed in the, or how, how early Christian worship informed how these early Christians thought. Uh, rather, attention, most of the attention, it seems to me, is on how... Uh, Greek philosophical concepts uh, informed Christian discourse. Um, when I was a master's student, one of the first things I learned in intro to theology was um, Prosper's, uh, Prosper of Aquitaine, his famous, uh, uh, the law of, uh, was it the law of prayer or the law of worship? Lex Orandi establishes the law of believing um, does Harnack get into that issue at all? Because, I mean, it's, it would seem to me, one thing that I think gets lost, um, and I think Harold Buchinger has done some good work on this, 
is um, reminding us that the baptismal rituals and the, and the Eucharistic rituals and the life of prayer also, um, uh, for lack of a better term, influenced or informed how these individuals thought. And that's something that seems to get left out of these discussions. I don't, I don't know um, what, what your guys' thoughts are on that, but Christoph, you have your hand up on that. Reinach, as a classical Protestant of the 19th century, also he was the son of a professor of practical theology. He grew up next to the, not the university church, the town church, the Protestant Lutheran town church. The uh, apartment of the father is uh, directed opposite the street, the choir of the St. John's church uh, of uh, Dorpart, Tartu. Um, and, and also he lived personally a quite um, intensive, uh, th th there was a, um, a morning service in the household of Arnak. He uh, preached, uh, they were singing. We know that he went crossing a graveyard, uh, was singing Paul Gerhardt hymns with his children and grandchildren. So liturgy in his personal life life played a large role. He, he preached uh, at, at the university sermons from 1917 on, he preached when others were, but the focus of a, a ordinary Protestant German professor of the 19th century was completely neglecting liturgy. And um, Hans Lietzmann is the large exception. And uh, Harnack published certain monographs by, the, there were at the Berlin faculty, certain professors at the same time, parish pastors, von der Goltz uh, and um, uh, von Soden. Um, and those had a certain interest in liturgy and these things were published in the Hinrich Publishing House or in Texte und Untersuchung. And, and that's one um, of the, um, the necessary corrections in the um, in, in our view to, to to ancient Christianity with the Lietzmann brought in because of his context to Rome and to to um, professors at institutions in Rome uh, he came in contact um, when uh, sitting in the Vatican Library and mm -hmm. meeting uh, interesting Roman people th th that's uh, one of the, but, but the, their harnack is part of the um, design of Protestant um, uh, theology in in the 19th century and it's interesting because of the father and his personal behavior not interested in. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the Protestant background because that's where I wanted to take this. Uh, I'll do that in just a sec. Alphonse. Oh, this was what Christoph explained uh, according to Hanak with a view on early Christianity. I, I would have the following thoughts to your question, John. Uh, first, uh, of course, um, when we talk about philosophy, this is only a very specific part of early Christianity you know, for, for some educated people. Then we have lit we can mention liturgy because all Christians are in a way involved in that in some way or in another. And we have other institutions like, like the, the, the ecclesial communities and the towns and what's going on there and uh, the church hierarchies and and all that, all these institutions in a wider in a wider sense, and this all plays a major role in the development of Christianity. And personally, I'm convinced that uh, real developments in practical life and real experiences are always earlier than theological concepts oh. and, and 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 thoughts. And, and sometimes we can see you now we have this. When they start to speak of Jesus like a God, you now we have this in this famous letter of Pliny, where he where he says what he got to know from Christians, and one thing they say is that they meet in the morning, and then the phrase Christo quasi Deo canem dicere, so they sing hymns to to Christ like a God. So in a way, we have a liturgical practice, and then they start thinking, what are we doing when talking this way about Jesus and so on? 
And you can see it sometimes in, in other developments. So for this, I would say that this is always the, 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 the ground for all thoughts <laughs> coming, coming later. It's hard to detect because what we have are the are these texts for a high educated audience. So sometimes we have reactions in, in homilies or remarks of the homilies, what people are doing in the church and what they should not do, <laughs> and, and so on. So we have some glimpses into, into the real the real life. And and the last remark, because one of my colleagues here, a, a close friend of Harald Buchinger, Clemens Leonhardt who is doing liturgy at Münster here, one of his favorite, uh, I can even say enemies, is the sentence, Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. <laughs> 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 because despite what I said now, that the real life uh, comes first, and then the thought and the dogma, Lex Orandi and Lex Credendi is a dogmatic invention. Oh. My view. So that the later theologians then said, okay, what we are thinking now has been done before. And then they they look for the practice, and sometimes you really can see how you create a tradition, which did not exist before you created it. Uh, and then you say this is Lex Uranian Lex Credendi. So I would be very careful <laughs> with, with these four words. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Johannes, you had your hand up. Yeah, I've been going back and forth, but I, I, I think I think I'll, I'll I'll say one thing, and and I mean it may just be what everybody knows anyway, but it seems to me that we've talked so much about Hanek's interpretation of early Christianity, which of course is really what we want to talk about here. Um, uh, uh, but I think, um, I mean, but I think it's not to to understand his work. It's not just the fact that he's a historian, I don't think it's not either just the fact, as, as Christopher so beautifully explained, how he was sort of enculturated and uh, and, and 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 the kind of the kind of ideas that he picked up as a as a as a person of his age. I mean, we mustn't underestimate, I think, that to an extent there is a theological program underlying his historiographical work certainly in the history of dogma um and uh, and that and a theological which is also i think a kind of ecclesiological or religious program and the the upshot of that was that there is something that he thinks about as the end of dogma in his own time and what does it mean to say that there is an end of dogma well it means that somehow the way christianity now has a future in the modern world is is really as a kind of lived faith and this is where i mean there is some spiritual dimension there is some there is obviously an ethical dimension there's a we might perhaps say an existential i, mean, I don't want to say that you know paint that as an absolutely simplistic thing but i think it really matters and if we ask you know why is he not interested in liturgy i think that's partly because of that. I think that for Harnack, that what Harnack has in mind is, 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 a, is a form of Christianity that can that that can be lived in a world which in some ways has become a very secular world. Um, and 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 where he just felt that what he wanted to provide was a form of religion that was acceptable, you know, for the people in the early 20th century in the Wilhelmia and Germany and elsewhere in Europe who sort of felt they were very active, they were scientists and they were industrialists and they were successful merchants and so on and so forth. And what he, what he, I think, really believed was that there was a form of Christianity that could be attractive and relevant for these people without baggage of dog dogmatic language and to an extent i think also without the baggage of um of 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 a of a liturgical tradition that he thought perhaps many of those wouldn't find wouldn't find relevant but with a strong commitment to the to the kind of presence of the christian faith in day to day in day to day life and in their professions and in their families 
and in the way they they educate their children and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, I, I perhaps we've all uh, been trying to avoid sort of reducing Harnack's historical work to just an outgrowth of his of, of this agenda, which I think would be really wrong because he was an excellent historian. He had real interest in getting the history of early Christianity right. But at the end of the day, I don't think we can really abstract his historical interest from this specific form of, of, of theological, and as I, as I said, in a way more broadly, religious agenda that he was really committed to um, uh, and, and, and where he saw a way forward for Christianity at a time when he and many, many others, of course, felt that religion was basically in uh, in retreat um, already. Uh, Christoph, uh, just one sec, Christoph. So um, after you go, after after your remark, I'm going to finish up with the last question. We've been going here for about two hours. <laughs> so this, yeah. is, this, is, this has really been wonderful. Um, <laughs> I wish I could uh, go longer. Uh, but Christoph, you go, and then I'm going to bring it back uh, to the, this legacy question, and okay. uh, it'll make sense why I brought up the issue of liturgy when I explain uh, prior to asking that question. Okay, Christoph. Johannes is absolutely right. One has to add only one sentence. Um, the soul and her God, uh, God and the soul. Uh, soul isn't in the plural form, the souls. So uh, because of the situation, um, Johannes has explained, um, Harnack is interested in the individual soul, not in the community of souls. There's also, and, and literally is for certain reasons uh, in larger parts, I don't think um, the, 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 uh, that also the, the historians of liturgy, Clemens Eonhardt, will um, accept this view. Uh, liturgy is something where uh, more than one, in, in most of the, there are individual forms of liturgy, but uh, Harnack is interested in the relation of the individual to uh, God, and this is pietistic Lutheran heritage. Um, d d d and, and, and so it's quite clear um, the, the um, liturgy where, where texts are produced, also the, 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 such a large number of liturgical papyri and certain are edited in the Text und Untersuchung series, the Rapion of Tumores and all these things. Um, Obviously, that never ever brought him to, to change his view. But um, who is free from one sidedness? <laughs> so, so one should try not to mix the role of the last judgment and analysis of uh, uh, former patristic scholars. <laughs> so, we're here today to talk about the, the legacy of Adolf von Harnack. And yeah, uh, my, my background, I'm Roman Catholic, um, uh, did my master's degree with uh, Benedictine monks in Minnesota who were uh, very influential at uh, Vatican II and especially in the liturgical reforms. So they put a heavy emphasis on the liturgy as really the starting point for Christian theology. And I wonder, thinking about the legacy of Harnack and what that is, because he seemed this this idea, not just him, but this I the notion of the Hellenization of Christianity really seemed to receive a backlash um, in Roman Catholic circles. And I wonder if part of this emphasis on liturgy wasn't a response to this uh, notion. Uh, of this pure form, unadulterated form of uh, Jesus gospel Christianity that was later corrupted by Hellenism is a part of that. So thinking about Harnack's legacy, to me, he seems like someone who's often been mischaricatured because of these uh, very serious confessional debates between Protestants and Catholics. I don't know if there's anything to that, but how would you all um, describe the legacy 
of Adolf von Harnack. And we'll use that question to, to wrap it up here. Um, who should I start with? George, you haven't spoken in a while. I'm going to uh, put you in the spotlight. Is that all right? Yes, that's all right. Well, I think, um, well, despite the fact that we now reject uh, many of his ideas and sort of his um, conception of fairly Christianity and especially this duality that we discussed earlier, I think he was sort of an eminent scholar clearly and he was sort of instrumental in drawing people's attention, namely scholars of antiquity and patristic scholars to early Christianity and to sort of early Christian texts and to sort of this problematic about how we should sort of understand Christianity as a sort of a local religious movement that somehow uh, developed so rapidly and became sort of so uh, so dynamic and so philosophical and so uh, um, uh, so important in, in late antiquity and somehow uh, uh, embraced well well brought brought out so many important uh, figures and thinkers uh, like sort of origin and the Cappadocians and so on how this eventually happened and how shall how how shall we explain that I think he put his finger into that problem and uh, I, I think we should be grateful to that I think it's the nature of scholarship to develop and somehow to um, overcome uh, obsolete conceptions and to move forward but without some of them we cannot really uh, move forward and sort of discover sort of our own mistakes i think uh Hannah was sort of an important scholar and sort of very very uh instrumental to the sort of um uh, this renaissance of um, uh, patristic studies, early Christian studies that we now uh, also experience. Uh, Ioannis? Okay, so now the legacy in, in, in one, one long sentence. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, perhaps perhaps I would, I would um, sort of start my final comment by saying by asking, you know, isn't it remarkable that we even ask the question? Yeah. You know, Hanak published the history of dogma. It's now practically 150 years ago. Um, this is a very long time. And why is it actually that we feel it's still worth our while to talk about the, the, the legacy? And if we think of, of the past century, uh, I think it's, it's easier probably to find a, a, a people who've told us that Hanak was entirely wrong and that he should really be consigned to the dustbin of, of, of scholarly history than to find people who kind of celebrate him. I think what's wrong with him has been clear for a long time. And we've said quite a few about uh, quite a few things about um, op opinions of his, approaches of his, premises of his uh, that are really no longer tenable and probably weren't even tenable uh, by the time he died. Um, the question is, why do we still talk about him? And I would say one uh, one thing I kind of want to throw out here at the end of our conversation. Um, I mean, Hanak's part of, in some ways, the last generation, or perhaps he is one of the last people who had the capacity of writing comprehensive books on early Christian developments and we must remember not just the development of doctrine but also the spread of christianity and early christian literature which was basically to i mean was to a large extent built on his own primary research and i feel you know we are talk about legacy i think the legacy is that these kind of these are like gothic cathedrals in our cities i mean they are still there and it has proved, I think, very, very hard to move on simply because due to the specialization that's happened in the meantime, um, it's hard to think of any other scholar 
anywhere in the world over the past century who's had the capacity to do something analogous, to so, you know, do the same as Harnack did, but better. And I think for that reason, it, it often strikes me that some of the authors I read who are extremely vocal in denouncing Harnack's ideas and, and principles. And yet, if you look a bit below the surface, uh, you realize how indebted they still are to some of the some of the sort of fundamental principles that he established. And the reason for that is that it's kind of not really um, um, a, a more recent, equally foundational um, a, a scholarly text where we could say, you know, we just we just forget about about Hanak and instead turn to that to that other more recent text. Perhaps that will emerge at some point. Perhaps there's a possibility for some collaborative work that can produce that. But I think the fact that we still talk about uh, his legacy um, at this point indicates that with him, a period in scholarly history almost, I would say, comes to an end, which then produces, uh, or which in him produced these monuments of scholarship uh, that in some ways just continue to define the terms in which we define our, our business, in the, 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 the kind of questions we ask, the kind of problems we discuss. Um, and it just I just think it's a, it's a matter of historical record that generation after generation finds it very hard to say, okay, now we finally emerged from under this this long shadow of Harnax, whether we whether we like it or not. So his perhaps his greatest legacy isn't whether his descendants, uh, us, we uh, agree with him or disagree with him or like him or not. It's the fact that we are still talking about him 150 years later, and we're probably going to continue to do so for for quite some time. Christoph. Yes, I'm I'm a little bit more ambivalent because I have the impression certain ideas, vulgarized ideas of Harnack are now taken up by people is not correct because um, not taken up in, in an active way reading Harnack, but the idea that um, if, if, um, philosophy and Christianity are completely different forms of behaving um, in the world. The idea that we sh uh, can have Christianity without reflection in certain fundamentalist circles. So, so nothing um, is uh, in a di direct line with Harnack, but his vulgarized um, ideas are in, in different parts of today's world and are against a scientific reflection of Christianity. Um, th that's one of the uh, serious problems. So, uh, for example, this idea that there is a simple Jesus and uh, Messiah is quite problematic two years before 25, and that Trinitarian theology is an invention of absurd thinkers. Uh, th th these are all things uh, we have to face when discussing in Protestant um, parish circles on, uh, on the church and theology. So a vulgarized Harnack, which is in no way related with Harnack. And um, Harnack um, <laughs> is, uh, confront, uh, is confronting us with a um, more sophisticated version of certain highly problematic ideas on ancient Christianity today. Th that's the problematic dimension. As I said, ambivalence. <laughs> my, my, uh, the, the, the other thing is the, the legacy of Harnack is uh, behind me. The, the, there is a lack in, in the bookshelves. The, there is Hippolytus. The, the, that's all GCS. I, I couldn't do my work uh, with without, uh, we, we haven't uh, talked about the organizer, we haven't talked about, um, I have lots of text and untersuchung from the Henry Chetwick Library. Um, I'm consulting them every day. Um, uh, so from my first term, 
were in the first um, hour I had in the Marburg faculty, where we read Essence of Christianity. I'm always dealing, as Johannes said, with Harna. Uh, I'm uh, depending on his uh, work. I'm admiring. Today, no theologian would become president of Max Planck Society. Com completely impossible. He was in the center of the university discussion of his time. Uh, who uh, in in uh, from our disciplines, not only from ancient Christianity people, also from classics people, is now in the center of academic discussion and coining the whole discussion, delivering a lecture, and whole city is appearing and and uh, uh, overcrowding uh, the the aula magna of the university. Um, so to a certain extent. Um, it, this ambivalence, he is deeply coining my all day work, but he is also deeply coining certain highly problematic ideas of ancient Christianity, which I have to fight in broader public and in university. Uh, the, the idea that liturgy is something for uh, special, uh, specialized people still widespread in, in certain uh, academia. My whole generation did monographs on Trinitarian theology. No one um, of my generation did a Habilitationsschrift on questions of liturgy. Oh. Why? Oh. Harnack legacy. Oh. Oh. All right, well, uh, from the first to the last, like Origen says, uh, the end is like the beginning. Uh, Alphonse, um, uh, you're your first time guest here, so I'm going to give you the last word. What is uh, what is the legacy of Adolf von Harnack? And the end is different from the beginning because <laughs> of the experience you now got <laughs> after the beginning. That's also not, it's not only the same. <laughs> so I well, it's hard to say you know, something. I pretty much agree with with Johannes. Um, in my career, Hanak was not that important. Okay. There might be a, a, a confessional aspect in that. No, in Protestant theology is surely different. Personally, me, that's a con that's a kind of confession now. Okay. I loved more to read Franz Overbeck in my younger years, <laughs> who lived in, in Basel to in the same house as Nietzsche. No? They had dinner together nearly every day. <laughs> uh, and so a kind of counterbalance is really to read Franz Overbeck. There is a new German edition uh, for some time now. It's completed of all of his works. And very nice. It's more for laughing. Now, don't take it so seriously. This famous Kirchenlexikon. Oh. Now, now read the, the sheets on Hanak. Oh. <laughs> it, it's satiric. It's <laughs> 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 but sometimes true. <laughs> And to the content, um, for some, for quite a lot of ideas of Hanak, I was skeptical from the beginning. So what he says about Marcion and and two, two minor things. Uh, and so on these many hypotheses, if you look at them and you see, okay. So I think why he is so important and why we have this legacy is what Christoph said, because he was such a big organizer cool. of, of science of of editing and so on so well connected and then he has these huge and very very important editions no of gcs of text and not to suhung and and other texts uh, that's for what i use him but i say okay here is something which is still the basic for what has been done later so that would be my Tentative <laughs> resume on that. <laughs> you you cannot have a final word on that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I I doubt this uh, video conference here, this meeting uh, of us, our conversation will be the last word. Many more, much more ink will be spilled on uh, Arnak. I am very sure uh, in the future of our scholarship. Um, but this was a delightful conversation. I learned a ton uh, listening to all of you. Um, thank you all very much for uh, coming back on, Patricia Cass and Alphonse, for making your first appearance. This was delightful. Um, I hope you all uh, enjoyed it as much as I did.
Thank you, John. Yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you so much to yeah. you and to all. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. It was it was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. Have have a good day, Americans, and uh, have a good evening, uh, my European friends. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank bye you. bye, bye and all the best. A lovely yeah. summer to all of you. <laughs> yeah, the same for you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.